Today on Let the Bible Speak. Are your priorities the same as God's priorities? And welcome to Let the Bible Speak. This is a half hour Bible study program presented by the Church of Christ in your community. If this is your first time joining us, we're here to study the scriptures and let them speak concerning the spiritual issues and questions that we face. We're not here to preach politics or social issues per se, but to simply turn to the Word of God for answers concerning our faith in God and our service to Him. Now, you'll never hear us ask for a single dime. We're, we do not peddle products or ask for donations. We are simply glad that you're willing to take a few moments to look into the Word of God together. That's what we're about here. And we would encourage you to visit an assembly of the Church of Christ and see what I believe will be a marked difference. Our worship is simple and it's reverent as we strive to follow the Scriptures as our pattern for faith and practice. Today for a few moments, I'd like for us to talk about our priorities. Are your priorities in order? All of us have priorities in life, and those priorities will help determine our success, not only in temporal life, but more important, in our spiritual life. What are your priorities? What takes precedent in your life? What demands first place when it comes to how you allot your time, your talents, and even your treasure? If we prioritize things over, uh, of lesser importance over those things of greater importance, well, life will be much more challenging and problematic. For example, there's nothing wrong with some kinds of entertainment and recreation. But if we place those pursuits over serious matters such as paying our bills, putting food on our family's table, well, we'll find ourselves in financial trouble. With all that said, did you know that God has priorities? And if we're going to make a success at living the Christian life, we have to have those priorities straight. The Bible teaches that there are things that God considers fundamental. And therefore, they need to be taken care of first and then allow everything else to follow. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, in his Sermon on the Mount, when speaking of our worrying about temporal things instead of trusting in our Heavenly Father, our Lord said, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, this is just one of many times where the Lord tells us what, we should, what, what should come first in our lives. Our lesson today... Are God's priorities your priorities? And I'll return with that after a song.
One of the great challenges of life is determining the things that must take priority. Even if we know what our priority should be, living that way is often hard. But failing to recognize the truly important things and make them the priority in the long run leads to even greater difficulty in life. If you want to be successful in raising a family, running a business, acquiring an education, or perhaps being physically fit and healthy, well, you know you have to learn to set priorities and you have to put certain things before others. That's even more true in our spiritual affairs. And have you noticed that the Lord taught on several occasions about getting our priorities straight? He talked about putting first things first. And if we're to possess the mind of Jesus and be like Him, well, our priorities must be the same as His. So I want to talk about that for a few minutes. First of all, I want to point out that Jesus taught that the first thing we should seek after in life is the kingdom of God. You know, after all, this was Jesus pressing priority during the 33 and a half years He lived upon earth. The Lord could have spent that time doing any number of things, but of course He would have disobeyed God in so doing. Jesus did not come into the world seeking the kind of fame and fortune and fun and frills that humans usually spend their lives pursuing. His attention was not focused on the things that most of us gaze at and long for and live for. Jesus rather lived a humble life. As God, now He already owned everything before He set foot upon this earth as the incarnate Son, but as a man, he possessed very little. He had no permanent home. He didn't settle some piece of land and build an estate. He did not live his life planning how to get more and build better. He didn't concern himself with keeping up with the fads and fashions of the world. And even though I'm sure the Lord enjoyed His creation while here and found rest and rejuvenation from time to time, perhaps enjoyed the simple little pleasures of life that uh, day by day may afford, the sum of his life, the focus of his heart and his mind was a determined quest for the kingdom that he came to assume. His first and life-consuming concern was doing the will of God and accomplishing what his father had sent him here to do. And thus he spent the short years of his life looking toward and beyond the cross to the crown that one day awaited him. When he made his famous trip to Samaria in John chapter 4, you may recall his disciples went into the city leaving him at the well where he met that woman whose life he forever changed. And after she had gone and the disciples returned, their concern was whether Jesus had eaten anything. They were concerned about his physical situation and they urged him to eat and take care of those needs. But Jesus, however, replied in John 4 verse 34, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus never ate food, for He did, just as any other human has to do to physically live. But rather, Jesus was teaching His disciples an important lesson about what His life was all about, and by extension, how we should look at our own lives. When He preached the Sermon on the Mount, as recorded by Matthew, he taught the same principle to those who would follow Him. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25, He said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, let's be honest. Don't we all worry to a great deal about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, where we're going to live, what we're going to drive, how we're going to pay the bills? But listen to Jesus. He says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and uh, in tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now, was Jesus teaching that it's wrong to eat, that it's wrong to buy or make clothing? Well, of course not. That would contradict things we read about His own life because Jesus wore clothes and He got them from some place. He ate food. He worked with His own hands in a carpenter shop to provide those things for Himself. You see, what Jesus is talking about is an inordinate emphasis upon temporal things, 
a preoccupation with physical life, and thus a lack of faith in God, a focus on that which is temporary and fleeting, so that the spiritual realities are obscured and even missed altogether. As he once said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We need to be reminded of questions like that on a regular basis. Jesus is rather saying those things should be minor and secondary in our lives. We should trust God to make those things accessible and available to us if our focus and our overall concern in life is that which is eternal and spiritual. If that's the case, God will open the doors. God will not let us go hungry. God will give us the ability and the means to provide the things that we have to have and the things that we need to survive on this earth if our focus is upon the kingdom of heaven. Now he says the godless Gentiles worry and fret over money and food and clothing and making ends meet in life. But his people are different. And he goes on in verse 33 to say, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now you know if we're honest with ourselves and we're Christians, can we say that our life is wrapped up in pursuing the rule of Christ in our own hearts and in the hearts of others? Are we obsessed with spiritual things? Are we obsessed with eternal life? Are we obsessed with obtaining or rather advancing the reign of Jesus the Christ in this world and treat the physical needs of life as a secondary concern? Or is it the other way around? In reality, does your life, as Jesus warned in Luke 12, verse 15, consist in the abundance of the things you possess? Or is Christ and His kingdom, His church, are those things your life? Well, that almost sounds radical to the ear of someone living in a Western first world culture. But Jesus' teachings are radical. And they demand full surrender and sacrifice. Or we don't really understand His message and we're not really His disciples. You see, it's not wrong to work for a living or even to enjoy recreation and so forth and to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. In fact, the Bible strictly commands that a man does work to provide for his family, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, and if he doesn't, he shouldn't eat, Paul said. But when we make our life's pursuit the kingdom and the righteousness of God, when that becomes the priority, everything falls into its rightful place. If we don't make the kingdom of God the priority, however, we will never truly realize His kingdom and we will fail in the Christian life. Many, and I repeat many, a professing Christian is of very little use to God and is a failure in the realm of faith if for no other reason than they truly do not seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The church in many cases and in many places is very superficial. It's very worldly. It's very ineffectual. Because those who make up that church are not truly seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness above all else. There's an old illustration that's been repeated many times, by myself included. It says that a professor stood before his students one day with an empty bucket. He filled it full of rocks and he asked them, is the bucket full? Well, they were clever enough to figure out the real question and they rightly said no. He said, that's correct. He then poured some small pebbles into the bucket until they fell down among the large rocks and came up to the top. And Again he asked, is the bucket full? They said, not yet. He then poured sand into the bucket until it reached the brim. And once again the student said, it's still not full. And then he poured water into the bucket until it soaked down amongst the sand and it finally spilled over the top onto the desk. And he said, how about now? Is it full? And they said, yes, it's now full. And he said, well, good. Now what does this teach us? And someone spoke up and said, well, this is about time management, it seems. And if we learn to apportion our time, we can always do more and accomplish more. No, no, the professor replied. This is not a lesson in time management. It's a lesson in priorities. And the lesson is that if you are going to get the bigger things into the bucket, you're going to have to put them in there first. Now, that's the way it is with life. And that's certainly the way it is with Christ and the things of the Spirit. That's the way it is with the church. It's work. Your part in the church. The life and the duties of every Christian. You see, our problem is many of us see religion as a niche, or at least we treat it that way. One of many categories in life, and we just divvy up and apportion our life and a little bit here and a little bit there, and we have to attend to religion over here. But that's not Christianity. Christ is to be everything. 
His kingdom, which is expressed in His church and its mission and its work, is to be our everything. It's to influence and affect every phase of our life. It's to direct every aspect of our life, every decision that we make, everything that we involve ourselves in. And then when that is the case, everything else finds its rightful place. Is that how you live your life? Is that how your priorities are arranged? Well, if not, then you're really covetous, which the Bible says is idolatry, and your priorities are not God's. We're to worship Him and not things. Somebody said we're to use things and worship God, but many of us worship things and then try to use God. The first thing needs to be His kingdom and seeking that kingdom and His righteousness within our own life. And then there's something else that must come first in our life according to Christ, and that is our inward character. On one occasion, Jesus severely scolded the Pharisees of His day for their preoccupation on the external deeds of their religion to the neglect of the inward character that should have been the basis of their religion. That was the Lord's complaint with the Pharisees. It wasn't their religion. It wasn't their practice necessarily. Where they did keep the law of God, Jesus praised them for keeping the law of God, when they did, how they did. The problem is they were so focused on that part of the law of God that dealt with the outward man until they neglected the change that should have taken place within within the inward man. Now Matthew chapter 23, read beginning verse 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, and anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. Those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." Now, here again we have Jesus teaching us about priorities, not mutually exclusive things. The Lord is not saying that external ordinances or outward manifestations of faith, that those are not important. Certainly not. And that's how many people use verses such as these. But please notice that Jesus was not discouraging obedience to the outwardly manifest deeds of the law. He was not setting those aside. He was not saying they were unimportant. He wasn't brushing them off, making them insignificant or inconsequential. Unfortunately, many have been led by false teachers to believe that what we do or how we worship or how we outwardly live our lives, even dress ourselves, is unimportant as long as we're nice and we mean well. Listen, that's totally false. And it misrepresents what Jesus was saying. Notice that he talks about those things that pertain to the law they were living under at that time, the law of Moses, such as paying tithes of various things. And he does not say you shouldn't worry about all of that. He doesn't say that's all unnecessary. Rather, he says those you ought to have done. So what is he saying? He is saying that they were concerned about doing those things without being concerned about things that were more fundamental Not more important per se, but more foundational, more fundamental. And that is the reform of the inward character. And in doing those things which were good and right, they were leaving undone the things that were foundational and rudimentary, such as justice and mercy and faith. Now the problem that we still have today is that people try to make these things mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. They're interconnected, one built upon the other, if they are properly understood and observed. Does God care how we worship? You'd better believe He does. How we worship. The actions that we offer to God as worship and service, those are sacred and serious business. And God does not accept worship that is not within the teaching of His Word. Make no mistake about it. But also note that worship that does not come from a sincere, humble, and converted heart That's an abomination to God, regardless of how outwardly correct it may be. 
unscriptural worship from a nice and friendly person is wrong, and it's rebellious. But at the same time, orthodox worship from a mean and hateful and worldly person is just as wrong and offensive to God. The Bible, for example, teaches that a woman is to let her hair grow, to have long hair that's a glory to her, and it's a sign of her submission to the God's order of headship. Paul teaches that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, particularly in verse 15, and that she is to dress in a way that is becoming of a godly and submissive woman, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And a woman who refuses to do those things is disobeying God. But, as I heard one man say, if a woman has a hair long enough to sit on it and a dress that sweeps the ground, but a long tongue to match, well, she's not saved. And that's correct as well. You see, her long hair and her modest dress is to be an outward manifestation of what is on the inside. Now, if it's an outward display that contradicts what's on the inside, it's a disgusting display of hypocrisy. It's a repugnant thing. But there's nothing more lovely and there's nothing more beautiful than a woman who is modest on the outside because she is godly and modest and restrained and humble on the inside. And that's true of women and men. That when we concern ourselves only with the outward demonstration of our religion, instead of allowing that outward demonstration to naturally emanate from a Christ-like heart, well then we're no better than the Pharisees and our religious show is just as contemptible as theirs. So what's the answer? Throw the baby out with the bathwater? Ignore the way we should be conducting ourselves, the duties that God expects us to perform, the way we should live, the way we should dress. And so no. But rather, as Jesus said, first cleanse the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be clean as well. Very much related to this, Jesus once said that we're not to judge, lest we be judged. Matthew 7, verse 1, one of the most abused verses in all of the Bible. Was Jesus saying that it's wrong to discern between right and wrong? And uh, to adjudicate the actions and words of other people based on what the Word of God teaches? No, that's not what he was saying at all. That would contradict what he said in other places where he, for, for instance, said we're to judge righteous judgment. If that were what Jesus was saying, church discipline would be wrong. Yet the Bible teaches church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5 and other passages. We would not be able to mark and avoid false teachers, but yet the Bible tells us to do just that, Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. So what is the Lord saying? He's teaching that we need to first make sure our heart is right and we're trying to live our life in keeping with the law of God before we concern ourselves with whether someone else does. Not be a hypocrite. Now that doesn't mean live and let live and just let, uh, keep your own doorstep clean and let everybody else do as they please. It means don't be a hypocrite. When you point out the error and try to clean up the sin in someone else's life, check your own motive. And check your motive by checking your own life. Make sure you're just as concerned about where you stand before God as you are where they stand before God. Otherwise, we're just a hypocrite. Again, these are not mutually exclusive things. We are to judge ourselves before we judge another. And when we first judge ourselves, we will find that we will then have the humility and attitude to administer the right kind of constructive criticism and judgment and render the kind of godly aid that will lift people out of sin and point them to the Savior. Now, if time permitted, we would look at another thing Jesus taught us in His great Sermon on the Mount that should come first and is very much related. And that is, if we've offended our brother, we're to prioritize that relationship and go and be reconciled and then come and offer our worship or our gift to God, Matthew 5, verses 21 through 24. We don't have time to explore that, but the principle is essentially the same. Get your heart right, and you'll then get the other things right. That's why God looks upon the inward man. It's not that He's unconcerned about the outward behavior, for He is. But the outward behavior that pleases God only comes from a person whose heart is converted and being molded into the heart and fashion of Christ. He delights in the outward service of those who first seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, those who are of a clean and pure heart, those who show mercy, justice, and faith. Are God's priorities your priorities? All things are ready.
Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Well, thanks for getting your week started by studying the Bible with us for a little while today. We hope you enjoyed the program and that you'll join us again the next time we're on the air. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, we have a free printed transcript we'll be happy to send you. Simply ask for the lesson, Are God's Priorities Yours? And we will get that lesson to you as soon as we can. And also, remember you can find us online. Be sure to check out our website, ltbstv.org, and connect with us on social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram. We would be appreciative if you would do that and share the content with your friends and neighbors. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week ahead. And if God is willing, I'll meet you back here for another Bible study next time. Until then, God bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.